Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in. Oh, that's over? Alrighty. What's up, guys? Happy New Year's. I hope you had a relaxing holiday season together with your loved ones and you're ready to rock and roll 2023. Welcome to a new episode of Venture Europe with me, Colleen Fabry. Our super guest today is Joel Nordstrom, co-founder and CEO of Atlar. At Atlar, they automate and streamline bank payments for companies. Prior to founding Atlar, Joel was employee number 12 at Tink, the open banking pioneer acquired by Visa for $2.2 billion, where he also met his co-founders. They recently raised 5 million euros, round led by Index Ventures and joined by La Familia, Cocoa VC and some prominent angels like Revolut CFO Miko Salovara, former executive vice president of global sales at Adyen, Tyne Lamersh, and N26 CFO Jan Kemper. During this episode, we discuss about how Joel hustled to get the job at Ting. Oh my God, you'll love the story. How they ideated and tested ideas until reaching and settling for Atlar and their product strategy for global domination. But before we meet Joel, let's listen to why Sophia from Index and Anthony from Cocoa Invested. A million thanks for the input, guys. Really appreciate it. Handling payments is the lifeblood of any business. And this is where Atlar comes in. Atlar's payment operations platform and automation API is a category creating product, enabling the automation of all company payment activities without the need to manually communicate with banks. The Atlar team is, in our view, ideally positioned to build this business. Joel, Joel, and Johannes are both technically and commercially strong and have a deep knowledge of the space they're operating in. From my first meeting with Joel, I was completely captured immediately. His single-minded determination to go after the opportunity was clear. A unique blend of payments and banking integration expertise with a sharp commercial instinct. And he was partnering up with two ex-colleagues who complement him ideally. A match made in heaven, really. After having met with every team popping up in the space, it was clear to me that their know-how, relationships, expertise, and ambition were unparalleled. So it was a no-brainer for me. Hey, Joel, how are you doing? I'm enjoying the last the, the last day of snow now, for now at least. Hopefully we'll have a, a bit more. But I guess, I don't know if you've been able to, to travel around Stockholm at all, but a lot of people have been snowed in with a meter or, meter or so of snow dumping the last <laughs> few days. But it was just beautiful outside, right? All my Swedish friends, they're like, okay, you should be very happy with it because it's going to be gone maybe in three, four days. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much for, for taking the time. Very much appreciate it. Maybe we can start with the story of you joining the Tink team, your employee number 12 at Tink. So maybe we can start with how you joined Tink and then what are your learnings into open banking and scaling into a regulated market? Thanks so much, first of all, for having me on. Really glad that we can make this happen. Right now, I'm, I'm CEO and co-founder of Atlar, where we help companies automate their payments. Lots of stu- super exciting things going on there. But actually, I started my career in, in Think. Joined Assembler in number 12 and, and worked there for about six years. Both me and my co-founders, Joel and Johannes, were at Think as well. So I think we're immensely grateful for Daniel and Frederick for having us on and, and letting us learn as part of the journey. And yeah, the story of how I got to think initially was I was studying at SSC, business school in Stockholm, and I had this idea that I wanted to fix the mortgage market as a bachelor student. For some reason, I thought that was a good idea. And the reason I thought it was a good idea, you had seen mortgage, not interest margin, a spike in, in Sweden since the financial crisis, right? And it had gone from like 0.4 percentage points to 1.8 or so. And that was like, my analysis was, it was largely due to inefficiencies in the market and how people could switch mortgages. And I wanted to build a mortgage switcher and, and I had basically had two problems at that point. It, it turns out I had many more problems if I were, were to fund a company myself, but I, at least at the time I thought I had two problems. And problem number one was, okay, if I want to do a mortgage switcher, how do I get data about the mortgage app- applicants, about the current mortgage, their finances, all of that. And two, how do I get users so I can actually extract some deals with banks? Them. As part of that research, I found what was then called the Tink app. So it was this app with a turquoise green. I mean, today, you would never sort of get funding or any customers if you use that color, but it was, it was cool at the time. All fintech apps were green and had like 250K. So Swedes uh, signed up. That then started looking at it and I saw like they had the mortgage data and all data because you 
connected your account to it, right? And they had all this quarter of a million users. So all of a sudden, like, I was thinking maybe, uh, why should I be doing this? This is like perfect platform to do it. So I put together a pitch deck and I was using this. And that's a recommendation to like, you, you should never, never ever use those templates if you want to look professional. But I thought I was going to look professional by using the templates in Google Sites. So I used some of this like with some flowers and some beautiful, like cool colors. Oh my I thought, God. And I was like putting in, like, I, I also tried to visualize it. So I did like Tink app in the bottom. And then I did like a, like mortgage, like a mortgage icon of like the bank on top of the pyramid. And like, so I was like playing around with all of this. So, so I prepped that deck and then the ping Daniel, who's CEO and co-founder of, of Tink. There were like, yeah, 10 people at the time had just gotten their series A, 4 million series A. And pinged him and said, hey, I got an idea for you. Can I come and present it? And, and he responded a couple of days later and I was thrilled, right? So I, I went to that meeting, yeah, super pumped. This was late 2015 and I went in and just full energy. I was like starting and, and did the pitch. I was like, so Daniel, I got this idea that you should be doing a, a marketplace in the Tink app where users can refinance their loans and move savings money around and all and Daniel froze, lost his speech for a while, and then said, well, let me go and get my computer. I'll just show you what we've been working on. So there's like no confusion on who came up with what here. And then he got, in, got his computer and showed what was then called Tink 2.0, which was then Tink app, this personal finance management app going from read-only to being actionable and actually being able to, to take action on your finances, but also improve them by moving you know, mortgages, moving savings money around. So they were actually going to do this thing that I had been for prepping my, my slides for. Then it turned into an, a job interview. Like this was two minutes into the meeting and Daniel, he, both him and I sort of realized that this is that job interview now. And, and then he, he asked like, okay, so, so what, what can you do? Like, do you have any, do you have any skills? And as like a business bachelor student, I realized like, this is not a guy I bullshit. Like, like let me just be straight with him. So I said, like, to be honest, I can't design, I can't code, but like I'll hustle for you. Like I, I, I promise you, if if you take me on board, I will like do whatever it takes like to your time. But you'll have a lot of stuff to do, and I'll do this stuff for you. And uh, yeah, I mean, we from then you know, reconnected a week later or so, and I got a first task. I eventually landed the job anyway. So and since then, I was chief of staff type of role for the first year, two years, and then monetizing the app, and then last the four years was working in partnerships and launching markets, led teams for, for strategic deals, so partnering up with Amex and many other iconic brands. It's pretty much the, the, the ride, I think. When you're in a startup, the roles change quite a lot. So I think also Daniel really needed a, a hustler that he can rely on like a general, you know, like whatever needs to be taken care of. You just know that you have someone that you can trust and you can put on the task. Looking back at this six amazing years you guys went through tremendous growth and then the sale to visa for two billion what are your learnings in open banking one because also i would assume that open banking came around 2015 2016 right. and then also on the other hand what did you learn on scaling in a regulated market so i think the, the biggest meta takeaway is like daniel and frederick saw the open banking back in 2012 when they found a tink and they started reverse engineering the banking apps that had just come out. And they saw that this is going to change the world. This is going to change the way people do payments, change the, how people manage their, their finances. But it basically, it takes a decade. That's like the meta learning, if anything. That, and still it's really in its infancy. So it's probably going to take like two decades until it really changes the world. And that's like, it's so hard to internalize because you want to be, you're always over optimistic. You're always. You always want things to happen immediately, but like the, the biggest meta learning from, from open banking is just the incredible patience you need with this type of new, your game changing new type of infrastructure opportunities. The second is, is scaling in a regulated environment and an environment where you actually handle people's or companies real money. We think of it, of it to, I think, and, and uh, now that like one mistake, one big screw up and you exit the gene pool. Like if we would have had one data leak with banks back at, I think you're done. You exit, right? You exit the race, start, and maybe you can't even start over because your reputation is ruined. So you have to put that first of all, while you grow hundred percent year over year. <laughs> and that's, but you can never compromise on, on, uh, security, compliance, reliability. 
And that's, that's massive learning. And luckily we never got to learn that the hard way, right? But we actually, we, we learned it by not, not doing that mistake. And the third, third bit is around the organization. That's just a yellow company from 10 to 700 or 600 or so employees. It's just, there were times when the company was growing 200% year over year. And you can just see how much pain it creates because first of all, everyone who actually knows what they're doing and knows the company, they're spending time onboarding people. Second, you start hiring, you, you onboard some people that are managers that start hiring teams before they're onboarded. And that's, that creates a quite vicious loop where if you don't stop it, all of a sudden you've got a, an environment, a culture or a team that's just going spinning out of, out of control. I think the, what the, the general recommendation is always, it's to hire slowly, hire with very high quality, hire slowly, what, which think did most of the time, it was just at some point in time that we're scaling maybe a bit too fast and then had to, had to slow down significantly and then you know, s- start growing again. But that type of choppiness, I think is something we ideally want to avoid. Interesting. And also, I guess now you have <clears throat> the extremes of what happened in the end of 2021. You had all the incentives and the mindset to grow almost at all costs. And now all of a sudden, the market dynamics have changed. And unfortunately, if you move too fast, then you really have to cut back down now. Take us to the moment when you decided to start Athler. What was what was the insight into the problem? So I mean, we had an amazing run at, at Tink, right? I was there six years. I loved every minute. I learned so much, made friends for life. Johannes was there eight, my co-founder and CTO. Joel was there like three, four years or something, my CBO and co-founder. Visa coming in as an owner. We decided to team up and basically transitioned out. We started exploring a couple of ideas. We did everything around, I mean, we're looking at, which is now timely, right, with, with everything happening in pipe, but like revenue-based financing or crypto or things that were hot right now. And I always ended in a dead end that this is, this is not for us. Like, why should we be building this? Or like, why should we follow the hype? So we, we just flipped it and, and then thought about, okay, what are some actual problems out there that we could just start solving and then we'll see where it takes us. And one of the problems that we, we started looking at was this, that while you've had so many good solutions for accepting payments, so the Stripes, Adyens, Mollys, I think you know, probably a trillion euros in market cap or something just created over the past decade. Maybe that's now, but the, at the time. And you have open banking on getting consumers, typically consumers data in, right? Or payments in from consumers. There's like a void in how companies themselves handle their payments and how they automate all of those payments flows once it hits their bank account. So we started looking at that. And we also knew from our time at open bank, in open banking that it's not really a... Because everything open banking is built around consent. It's built for... It's a consumer regulation at heart. So everything is tied to consent. Everything the regulator cares about is the quality of the consumer APIs. Yeah. And therefore, it's not really fit for purpose for, for automation. So we knew that wasn't the solution. We knew like PSPs weren't really a solution. So we started looking at that. And we then just went through and started talking to companies and then conviction group. And eventually we decided this is it. So let's go for it. Walk me through the process that you guys did on all the other ideas, because I guess there are a lot of founders listening. So you just mentioned we looked to all these other hot areas, but we were reaching a dead end. Like, what was the process and the thinking behind it to decide, okay, we shouldn't pursue this? So two things. One, technical. So we tried to build stuff. So we tried to build the crypto. We, we were looking at this real world lending space. So whether, you know, you can land in the real world and then tokenize that and like put it on the, which is by the way, I think it's a, it's going to be a massive category in the next decade or so. And just looking at like the maturity of trying to build stuff on Ethereum insulated to, it's just obvious that, at least for us, I mean, there's lots of great people that are building the plumbing and everything, but for us, it was a bit too early. Then from the commercial side, just trying to push it from, and trying to talk to lending companies that we had gotten to know over the years or friends that companies and just trying to see if there's something there and then when you get this like you can feel that there's like there's not a real demand and if there's not a real demand then you as a startup you're no, never going to actually make something happen because you're unproven you don't have any credentials you, you, you need to feel that this is a real pain if you want to go for it and then the third bit was regulatory as well so for all of those things we actually look at regulation now especially when you look at crypto and as tokenizations there's you get hit by or you can can potentially be hit by a lot of different regula- the regulatory requirements that there's just a lot of unknowns around that. 
Got it. And if we if we move back to Atler, give us an example of a customer that you have. So you mentioned that you facilitate the automation of payments within a company. Can you give us an, an example? Yeah. So I can take back to that I just mentioned, which is a German embedded landing company. So what we do for them, right, their business is they embed into PSPs, payment service providers or marketplaces like you know, deliver, food delivery platforms where uh, restaurants onboarded. And they offer them credits through that channel. So they offer a PSP customer a credit of saying, hey, we see you're making this much a day. Do you want you know, 30 days up front so you can buy a new, a new washing machine or a new kitchen sink or whatever that might be. So that's what they do. And, and when you want to do that, there's, of course, a lot of complexity on actually getting it embedded, getting it, getting the platform convinced. And lots of things around credit decisioning, lots of things, uh, of course, around securitization and, and like a lot of problems then when you actually lend money. But and one of them is that you actually have to disperse the money mm-hmm. to the to the borrower and you need to be able to repay the, have them repay the loan. And the way that banks were specifically was doing this was initially they were just as pretty much all companies doing it via file uploads to the bank. So they're saying these are the loans of the day uploading it to the bank, then taking a, another file once it's time to repay the loan and just uploading it. And then the bank executes those debit payments from the borrower's accounts. And that's, that doesn't scale, right? So it doesn't scale and you have to, you have to throw people at it. You have customers being angry at you because you somehow, you know, missed some payments. All of these problems that happen when you add money, money processes to something else as critical to as payments, right? So what they had done then is they had actually with a previous bank partner connected to the bank, connected over like file transfer protocol to the bank. And then, you know, made it work, like staffed, staffed it up with an engineering team. And all of a sudden, you know, they had to connect another bank. And that's when we, you know, wrote, wrote to them when we had started the company and had a couple of first customers in, in the Nordics. And yeah, they were just, they didn't want to do this themselves. So it was more or less a no brainer. And then they and instead can just connect to our API then they can immediately be able to initiate payouts, collect repayments, and everything is automatically reconciled, meaning it's matched off. So you know what money you, you, that the money you expected to leave has actually left the account or the money that you expected to receive has actually been received. I would assume that you guys barely started, but give me a sense of where you are at the moment, maybe in terms of, I don't know, traction technology, but then also what do you see the market potential here? So I think... The fortunate position we're in is that we've we managed to uncover a very, very big pain point for European companies that handle money for third parties as part of their products. Right? That's like the definition of ideal of our, our ideal customer. And right now we're just focusing on like satisfying that by demand, building out bank connections, talking to customers, or and just getting them live, right? Yeah, that's pretty much what we're spending all of our time on. We're in a good place. I think the insight from that we learned from previous jobs were it, back to this point of like localization, that it's so hard to expand across Europe if you're taking a like a US product and then you need to localize it all of a sudden to like 30 or so markets. But we, we flipped it and thought that like, okay, day one, we're going to support multi-market. So what we did was we built a platform that supports Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Germany, meaning we need to support many different bank protocols, many different currencies, and many different customer types, right? So that's what we've been focusing on for the first nine months or, or so, six months or so, and are now at a, at a point where we got customers across Nordics and Germany, and we've proven that like we can support multi-market use cases. And it is just something that I think we're so glad we've spent time on because it's really hard to retrofit. So you recently raised 5 million euro seed round led by Index Ventures. And by any measure right now, we are in a very uncertain market. How did you prepare for the fundraise? And what is your advice for founders listening to increase their chances of success when raising seed? I'd probably caveat all of this by saying that there are many better sources than than us out there, right? On how to fundraise. And, and every situation is different, right? So, but... I can tell you what, what we had and, and what worked for us. Like one was a very crude prototype, just visualizing what it is that we want to do. It wasn't, I mean, it, it was only happy path it, and we were upfront about that, but it visualized it. And especially when you did with opaque things like we've been talking about now, right? 
that like very much infrastructure payment flows. It's so easy to get lost and not really be able to follow what are these guys actually doing, right? And what what do they want to build? But visualizing it and building actually building something that investors could touch and feel helped a lot. The second was just that we we did that. We built that crude prototype, but also we spoke to a lot of people. Friend, friends in the industry, peers, random people with just LinkedIn outreach to, and you know, people are super open about talking about their problems. If you're honest and saying, "Hey, we got this idea. Can I bounce it with you? You're head of payments at company X. Do you have a couple of minutes to spare?" People are open, and then we could come in with a very, very clear understanding of the space, the alternatives, how we're tackling it differently, and why that's why we think that's sensible. And then three, I think the we had a team that we all know each other really well. I've known Johannes for. More or less seven years, Joel, eight years or so. And I mean, we like, very complementary skill sets as well for the first decades about that early team and the team that you then can assemble from there. So I think combo of actually showing, showing rather than telling, understanding the space and the customers really well, and then having a great team. And since then, we've been able to assemble a world-class team in, in our opinion. So we're super proud of that. Amazing. Congratulations. So let's Let's change gears a bit and let's get personal. What was the most challenging period in your career and how did you overcome it? Back in 2019, I had been at Tink for like three and a half years or, or so. And I got um, the job to launch the UK market. And we had uh, gone through one country manager. It's a very hard hire to make, by the way, and for various reasons from both hands. That didn't work out. We had another one, Rafa, phenomenal guy coming in from Stripe, who was going to join later in the fall. But I was going to come in to, to set that up. Right? And it was really, I think from the beginning, it was really, really tough. The job was to win bank and fintech deals, right? And, and on the fintech side, we had quite intense competition. A lot of the known names were already taken. They were already working with someone. We had them for, back at that time, a less mature offering as well. So... Uh, it was really hard. Then on the bank side, you could, you know, banks was really, it was really, really tough. Get them to just send all of their data to the cloud and then we'll do smart things with it and like we'll send it back. Like there was quite a hard pitch at the time. So we're struggling. I mean, it's hard to launch new markets, but getting pretty much no traction for like the first couple of months. And this was during the fall. At the same time, working on this deal with, with one of the neo banks was going to be massive for the company, like absolutely massive. We had been working on it throughout the year. It was like everyone, like it was going to happen. We had prepared so much, invested so much from product engineering and more or less out of the blue, it didn't happen, right? We lost it too. And not only lost it because the, the product didn't happen to a competitor. And like, that's the, the du- double-edged sword of, of having accountability that it's sort of, it's sort of you then that, that screwed up, <laughs> like we'd like it or not, really, regardless of the circumstances, it's on you. Another part of the job was I was still running a couple of the a part of the banking cells for, for Europe at the time. And had this deal in Austria that we're working on and had been working on for ages as well. So w- that wasn't done either. And uh, in going back and forth, flying back and forth to Vienna while juggling no traction in London and trying to make that happen, working nights and weekends. I call then mid-November at this conference in London City, I got this, this email from the bank, the Austrian bank saying, sorry, this is not going to happen this year. Let's touch base in the new year. And this was not a good uh, news to say the least. So I, I got on the phone with Daniel and told him that this is probably not happening. He, he won't like it if I said he, he panicked, but it was like pretty much panicking because we're doing a fundraise then to be able to keep investing and keep growing and, and doing all that. And part of that, I think his pitch was, we're going to grow 100% this year. And to get this was a really big deal. So we really needed it to, to reach that number. And so it was like, like this really has to happen. Like well, let's do whatever we can to to make it happen. Otherwise, we're in a big trouble, build. And then I was like well, on my way home from Money Live, like two days at a conference. I was walking home in, in London, and I was thinking through the the sequencing and realized, okay, mid November, if we're actually gonna make this happen, we needed to get one person convinced, and to get that person in a meeting, we need to convince another person in that. Like that's how banks work. Like it's very hierarchical, right? So, and to to do that, if that's gonna happen over email. That would definitely spill into the new year. Like we, you don't sign and do that quickly. So I realized like something dramatic has to happen. So I, I basically decided on the way that like, I'll just go over there. Like I'll fly there and wait in the reception and like get that meeting in. Otherwise there's no chance of it happening. It's just mm-hmm. like, like, it's worth the shot. So I called Daniel and he's like, he's silent. And then he's like, I got to call Frederick. 
which is his co-founder. So he called Frederick and I was like, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Let's, let's go for it. So I took a 515 flight from Heathrow to, to Vienna airport and went straight to the lobby and just waited there and called Danny and like, yeah, hey, I'm in the lobby. And I was like, you can't be in the lobby. That's like psycho behavior. You have to, <laughs> you have to go to, go to a cafe or something. And I was like, okay, fair enough. That's, I'll go to a cafe. And then, I mean, worked out. So I caught the flu on the way there, probably. So I was like 40 degrees fever, but got the meeting in for next week with big team, big group. And we're super happy about it. And then the deal still didn't happen. So <sighs> it's still, I screwed up that one as well, or screwed up, but it didn't happen right. And I was accountable for it. And um, yeah, that was a tough, tough period. I remember flying back to London, like with tail, tail between my legs, just like another one lost. And uh, luckily... I think we, we, we put through every, like a lot of the other things that was, had to happen, happened. So I don't think we grew 100%, but like close to it. And then, I mean, we took Christmas break off in Stockholm. I mean, was really, really overworked. And then I got back to it in London. And then we had a lot of things going the other way. So, I mean, that's when we partnered up with Amex, one of the biggest partnerships that I then I mean, led and had, had was working on with the wider team. But I mean, then upside of accountability. Of course, and lots of other amazing partnerships then happened that actually happened because of the same like type of work, and that then led to to the partnership with Visa. I think the moral of the story is really that nothing is done until it's done, right? Things have been going super, super well for us. I work every day to make it stay that way, but there are going to be very, very tough periods. And I think having had the privilege of doing those mistakes on someone else's behalf, even though I was accountable, I wasn't ultimately accountable, right? It's just the best type of school you can, you can go into being an entrepreneur. And, and how do you deal with the ups and downs? It kind of seems that one day you're closing a big account or you think that you're closing a big account, then they kind of change their mind. It's November, you make all these promises. It's almost like a domino that everything has to be in place. Which strategies did you learn to deal with the ups and downs? I think apart from the, the basics of sleep and eating healthy and exercising and spending time with loved ones that aren't in the crazy tech world it's always very good right i try to do one specific thing where i get overwhelmed or or lost during work right and and that is i try to just go back to basics in just focusing on the customer in whatever way is possible at that time the success of of our business is just how many do we solve problems for and how much do we solve problems for them, right? That's just the, that's the math, uh, math of it. So if we do that well, everything else sorts itself out. So I just try to shift focus. I drop one of my, uh, one of our customers a Slack message, check how things are going, call some a potential one up and check, you know, should we do something soon? Or like, what's blocking you? What, what do we need to do to make this happen? I, I talk to someone on the team who's working on some hard technical problem. And then usually, I mean, can't really, can't really provide too much input. I mean, there's some context around the, the customer and what their problems might be. I think the, the, it's wor it works well for two reasons, right? One is just the rational part of it that it is ultimately about that, right? Everything, you know, that's what invest like investors care about. That's what makes a successful company for employees to work out as well. So it's very, very rational to do that. And the, the other is just generally shifting focus from yourself to someone else. Just removes stress and anxiety because you just, you just, don't focus too much on yourself and your own problems, but just focusing on someone else and them. That's, that's usually a good strategy in life. Interesting. And, and what is the worst advice that you've ever received? So I think the, I probably forgot a lot of the worst advice, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the good thing about advice is like advice can come in many shapes and forms. It could be direct advice. So you telling me something about how we should run our business or how I should speak in at an event and the quality of that advice could be good or bad but it's like very direct that it's an advice you can also get advice by talking to customers and them just not being interested you could get the advice by trying to ship something that has no traction advice is information that the world gives you and that mm -hmm. you do whatever and i think the the important thing for any entrepreneur or anyone who'd want to do something anything successful really is to listen to a lot of advice and not judge it too much at like point of advisory you want to hear lots of, of input, and then usually the advice cancels out to zero. And it's not really that it's a like good or bad advice, it's just you add your own filter and biases and worldview and what you want to achieve on it. And then you form your own opinion, but it's just it's just input for you to digest. So I don't have anything specific. That's like a cop-out answer probably, probably, but that's how I think about it. I, I wouldn't call any like, advice bad or good in the sense, it's just information that you can use in 
in whatever way you, you decide. So you see it as a data point located on average at multiple data points and then put your own filter and see what makes sense and what not. Go to two different entrepreneurs. Both could be billionaires. One will say, never raise money. It's the worst thing you could ever do. You will lose all control. Just do it, bootstrap it like I did. And then you'll talk to someone else and they say, raise as much as you can, as often as you can, and just like hire a big team and just grow. Then you just need to add on like, where are these people coming from? Well, she, the, the, the person that bootstrapped this business, like did that in maybe some entirely different space or a different time and place. Um, and then this person that, that were raising a lot of money worked for maybe did it during the, the dot com bubble or, or maybe they did it, you know, after the dot com bubble and it was just such a moat for them to actually raise money. Like you need to just filter in like what biases or where, where's this per person coming from with this advice and then form your own opinion. What's the landscape now? Where on that scale do you, do you best land you to succeed as a business and win? Yep. I absolutely agree with you. And I think you're uh, referring to the interview with DHH, maybe. <laughs> He's just very, very much anti-VC. I think he has some good points, but also I think venture capital can be such a great tool to grow your business. It's the same like with UiPath. I was talking with, with Fred Destin. I mean, UiPath waited like, I don't know, 15 years to raise their first round. And now like we were discussing how during seed you can raise so fast, but those are the market conditions it's your duty as a ceo to make the best for the company and to grow the company and to make it a company ideally that it's a global company and everyone knows about so i that's absolutely right. agree with you that's right love it joel thank you so much for taking the time this was an absolute pleasure thanks so much for having me on it was a pleasure for my own too